a few things about me. Um, I like to study women's history just because now with the state of the government and the way politics are basically pushing itself, it's looking like, oh, thank you very much. Oh, you don't need this anymore. Okay. And with the state of politics, we can basically see that the push is very against women's freedom and equality and their liberty to basically have autonomy to anything, whether it's their body or to speech or to education. Well, we're going to have to bring it back a couple hundreds of years to ancient Egypt, where we discuss a amazing civilization that thrived on the equality of women of ancient Egypt. So I start us off with this timeline because it's undifferent to many other timelines that we could easily Google, where it basically shows you the dynasties through the kings and through the monarchy. I mean, yeah, through the men's rule. So the pharaohs would technically be the ones that they usually showcase. But in this case, it's showcasing time through the women and the women that ruled. What made it very easy in ancient Egypt for women to rule was the fact that the men didn't live very long lives. That will connect a little bit later on in the PowerPoint, but just keep in mind that these pharaohs and queens died relatively young, looking between the mid-20s to early 20s. I have this map in particular, the ancient Mediterranean map, because it shows very well the diversity and the trade routes that occurred between ancient Rome, ancient Greece, and ancient Egypt. This is extremely prevalent in the history of ancient Egypt and the way that the women ruled because it was all influenced by each other. Nowadays, we have social media where we can influence each other with a simple video, but back 100 years ago, it was based on the merchants who visited the shores of these kingdoms. If you came from ancient Greece, of course, you're going to have some influence to the new ancient kingdom that you are putting your feet on. From there, you could either extremely influence the culture, art, and design of the civilization, or it will just be simple influences such as food. Ancient Egypt did a very good job for many dynasties to be able to differentiate themselves from the rest of the Mediterranean, as the rest of the Mediterranean was very male-centric. Um, in Spanish, it's like machistas. So it's what the man says goes, and the women had very little say, if anything, when it came to the family, land, property, or even when they chose to marry. When comparing this or adding the juxtaposition between the modern Mediterranean map and the ancient map, we can see that all of these ancient kingdoms, now modern, have expanded vastly. Though, we know that ancient um, modern Egypt now is very male-centric as well. You could start seeing the trickling and the removal of equality between men and women in ancient Egypt as the timeline goes on closer to Cleopatra's reign and less to Mernith. Mernith is very important, and we will get to her in just a second. But to understand the trade route as we continue and how all this trade influences um, have hit ancient Egypt, we have to understand the Nile River. The Nile River, when they knew it, was not very large. As we can see, it was about a thousand miles that they understood of it, but in reality it was more than 4,000 miles long at the time. Which meant that their world was very small. The way that they viewed the world was small, therefore their ideas were also more confined. As more people came to trade with ancient Egypt and the ancient Egyptians, their influences expanded into more ideas and more knowledge that they thought they liked because it was new. Just because something is new doesn't often mean that it is the best way, but how would they have known if, not they, if they could not have seen into the future? But what they did see was their gods and goddesses because this is how they based their beliefs. Their beliefs and their mythology fit into a definition of what religion is today, but at the time, it was only seen as their common beliefs. You could have chosen to follow these, or you could have chosen to not follow these beliefs. Some famous ones are Isis and Osiris, the father and mother of the universe. 
Does anybody know what ancient and uh, ancient mythology is for Greek and Rome? Show of hands, anybody? Okay. So in the Roman and Greek mythology, we see it as the founder is one chaos, and then we trickle down more for the Greek mythology than it led to Zeus, right? His wife Hera didn't have much power. And then in Rome, very similar. Their gods were males, and then what predominantly ruled in their beliefs were the males. What made uh, their beliefs very special was that Isis was the giver of life. They would not have a male ruler in the belief sense if it wasn't for Isis. Isis is important to this story because her husband, who was also her brother, was killed by their brother Set or Seth. Set or Seth, who is shown right here, they consider him to be evil because he slices up and divides the husband slash brother Osiris into 14 pieces and scatters his remains around the world. So then Isis goes and takes the 14 pieces and assembles him once more in a wheat field in front of their son, Horus. From here, Horus at a very young age has a concept and idea of death. This gives a new doorway to how the ancient Egyptian people viewed death as well. Because if death was so accepting and was seen as a royal or almost a god privilege, then they too wanted to honor that aspect of life, or in this case, afterlife. What they also acknowledged as well was nature. Ancient Egyptian civilization was very good at acknowledging and having a symbiotic relationship between the animals and land that they shared between themselves. This is very obvious in their beliefs as, as we can see here because the deities, which are people or what they would put in human perspective, people with uh, animal heads and animal features show the symbiotic relationship between the culture. Can anybody make an observation on their attire? Okay, so we can see that a lot of these gods or goddesses have attire that we would have associate with a gender, but in their case, the big word is androgyny. The reason why they're very androgynous is because they had that symbiotic relationship with nature. It all ties into each other. They didn't subject or they did not remove a gender or species in their life simply because they observed it as less than. By keeping everybody on the same playing field, it ensured them a peaceful life and a state of mind understanding that after death, they will also seek peace. We went over Isis and Osiris really quick, but we do remember that the father was killed, Osiris. Osiris then joins his son, Horus, to the afterlife so that they may bring judgment to the people who also pass away, more particularly with the pharaohs and the queens. Did anybody watch the show Moonlight? Yeah, so we see in Moonlight that the character is judged based on his heart and they balance it and wait for a judgment whether he is going to go to what they would consider hell or if they will have a life of peace in the afterlife which is a field of wheat which connects it back to where Osiris was once more assembled and brought back to life his rebirth which was a field of wheat which also shows us that their food and their harvests make a giant connection as well to the way that they lived their lives. Again, nothing was taken for granted. That's only one example of how they essentially viewed the afterlife or how much power they gave to the afterlife. In the real life, while they were still living, they did a lot to acknowledge and give themselves a better afterlife. This is better shown in the higher families. So if you were a pharaoh or if you were one of his harem women or a 
person of basically royal descent because they had the financial means to honor their afterlife. The regular people did so as well through smaller traditions, but they had ways in their afterlife as well to acknowledge the same way that the royal family did the goddesses and gods. So the afterlife. What gave it so much power and why I'm focusing so much on it today is because when one person died in the royal family, it didn't just end there. If the Pharaoh passed away, it wasn't just the Pharaoh, right? In this case, or in many cases in ancient um, Egyptian civilization, it was often your kin. So your brother, who was your husband, or your uncle, who happened to also be your husband when he passed away, would bring so many people with him to honor and worship the gods and goddesses and the deities of the afterlife. But it's not only the afterlife that they also made sure to honor. During the um, living life, they acknowledged that food gave them life. And what gender would essentially be connected with giving life? Females, yes. So oftentimes the god goddesses or the androgynous figures that they connected to another living thing or living person would often be a female. For example, Hathor, who's my favorite, is the goddess of cows or bulls. And there is still the original stone of the goddess Hathor in Egypt today. Although it is just a stone, they knew and acknowledged that by eating and slaying meat, whether it be a cow or swine, they will continue to live because they did not comprehend nourishment in a way that we did at a modern level. They just understood eating made them live. Eating more gives you a happy life. But remember, because everybody was equal in their eyes, they decided to give a goddess to the cow, the giver of life, and her name was Hathor. We saw her a little bit in a previous slide where she had the head of a cow or a bull or just some horns with the little light in between to show the light that she gave of life. But now I ask you and ask the floor, how would you like to be buried? Because from a very young age, these gods and um, these kings and queens planned their afterlife. Would you happen to take your wife with you when you die? Or would you take your harem women if you die? Anybody? Well, I'm volunteer. Yes. I told my wife when I die to have me cremated and mix my ashes with that of my puppy. That would be the last And we'll spend eternity together. That's true. That's true. It's my plan. I wanted her to join me, but she said no. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else want to share how they would like to be buried? Somebody, come on, don't be afraid. No one's going to laugh at you. I told my silly story. Anybody yes. have to think about it? Go ahead. I want to be buried with my wife. But not buried. I don't know if you call it when you die. Like when you stand up in the wall. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, um, I want to be buried by myself because. I feel like when I came to this world, I came by myself. So when I'm leaving, I should leave by myself. I can speak up a little louder. That was a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I said that um, I would want to be buried by myself because when I came into this world, it was just me. So when I'm leaving, it should just be me by myself. Which is an idea that most of us have, right? I love that answer. But they didn't believe that. So for example, we're going to use the pharaoh. The Pharaoh passes away and he has a harem of women, approximately 60 women. If he happens to have appreciation for all 60 women, he can 100% make the demand to take them with him to the afterlife, which means that they would be sacrificed at an altar and mummified and buried right beside him so that he will not be alone. This could be done with their cats, with his children, as long as they weren't the next one to take the throne, or even other family members such as his mother or his uncle, which kind of sucks, right? You don't really want to be killed when one family member dies. 
but this was considered an honor for them, just to show how heavy it was to simply pass away in ancient Egypt. And the younger you were, the more grand the burial process was. And this goes for extremely old as well. When there was such a dramatic age that the person would pass away, they would honor it to such a degree that today we would look at it a little bit like a show. We would not understand why they would want to take their whole court with them into the afterlife, but to them it's because they wanted to keep partying even after they died. So to give a visual perspective on how grand that burial process would be, we know that the pyramids are very common, but inside the pyramids is what really, really showed the riches of the person that passed away. For example, we can see here all the artwork that lays across and on top of the walls, and each hieroglyph has a meaning. The hieroglyphs are why or how they communicate with others, whether it be living or not. This is because the ancient Egyptians in the early dynasties were preliterate. Does anybody know what preliterate means? Preliteracy is the time before we were able or anybody was able to comprehend written word. So the way that many things or many stories and traditions were shared was via word of mouth or images, right? So why not just paint all these beautiful murals around somebody that you honored so much to show them that even through the afterlife, you're willing to give that effort to tell their story and to share their tales. But then we look at the complexity of the pyramids as well, because they have no windows and no doors as they were built to confuse the Tomb Raiders. To do so, they had to assemble what we know today as light bulbs. They had their own version of light bulbs that we can see displayed in this hieroglyph, which is how we know they existed. There's a few replicas of these light bulbs in the museums in Egypt today, but we are unsuccessful on being able to replicate the technology on how they made it work. The way they made these giant light bulbs, which probably started from here all the way to here, is still a mystery to us to show us even though they had no literacy or no written word literacy, they were still able to comprehend the complex ideas that we were able to grasp today. Which is why, although I'm centering a lot of this around death, we can definitely see, and I'll come back to this one, but we can definitely see the processes on how they were able to understand and accept this equality upon all living things. I would like to start with Murni, the mother of the Jir. Now she and the Jir, who the father and the son have the same name, but that was also her father. When he had passed away, she decided to honor him and she actually did not want to be sacrificed because she had to be the person to look over their son until he was of age to take the throne himself. But the court accepted this only on the fact that she was also educated. So then Murnif herself decided to start small schools or small practices around the villages and within the palace walls to be able to educate women as well as the young boys. This education would allow them to gain jobs that were equal to or even better than the males were, which allowed them to have what? If you have a job, you can get money and from money you can buy property which is unheard of in, in the ancient world because oftentimes women were not even allowed to have a job or to step foot outside of the house without their husband's permission this line of power means that women held so much of equality that it wasn't even questioned for example if your husband happened to pass away and you were the one who owned the property, you did not have to give that property to your son or the uncle or any other male figure in the family, but you could keep it for yourself, which would keep you with financial means. And if your business was successful enough, it would lead to title. 
this social this amount of social class rising allowed the kingdom of ancient Egypt to reign for dynasties upon dynasties. Now a dynasty, because I keep saying it, is the section in which a family rules. So if the Roseros ruled from 100 to 300 BC, then that is the Rosero dynasty, okay? So dynasties upon dynasties goes beyond centuries and beyond hundreds of years, which meant that Merneith, this one woman who was uneducated at the beginning and could not read or write, started hundreds upon hundreds of years of women enjoying liberty. This brings us into the government now. There's much more that goes into the government other than queens and kings. We also have the court. The court is similar to how our democratic system is, where it's a checks and balance system. And even when there was a pharaoh, if he did not rule as a dictator, allowed the courts to also do essentially the same checks and balance systems within the court themselves, which meant that one law was not only passed by just one person, essentially allowing the laws to be for the people and by the people, which was extremely modern for such an ancient time. With the harems. So now I lead you to the question of would you marry your brother or sister, specifically <coughs> younger? Most of us would say no. Well, all of us would say no because it's pretty strange to marry your younger sibling. But in their case, marrying a younger sibling meant that you as the older sibling, now husband or wife, would be able to rule the ancient world or ancient Egypt more particularly in a way that suits you better. This ties in a little bit later when we hit Cleopatra because I want to be able to debunk a couple things with her. But we have the harem women which after talking about the government and all the equality that ancient Egyptian women were able to enjoy, seems a little bit prehistoric even for themselves. But in the harem women's cases, it was still even an option. The harem women were lightly educated upon the time that they were starting to menstruate. And then after that, once the king or the pharaoh did his rounds in the kingdom, he picked out the most beautiful, the most beautiful and more attractive women and with them and their family's agreement, these women would be taken into harems where they're well fed and where they would be well educated between the times that the pharaoh would not be there. When the pharaoh was at these harems, which would be technically these giant parties, he would try to impregnate as many women as possible because there was such a high mortality rate when it came to newborns and even the women. So he could not keep his lineage only in one woman, because in that case, you would not have much of a lineage. These harem women also enjoyed many of these freedoms as well as they were not kept as prisoners. They could leave at any given time that they were not pregnant with the Pharaoh's child, or if they are not getting pregnant or considered infertile, they would also be allowed freedoms outside the harem walls. The most fertile of harem women would be taken into the pharaoh's court so that he could have easy access to them, which meant that he could secure his lineage far beyond just his dynasty. Let's go back a little bit. Don't know what's happening. Okay, well, let's go to the influence. With the influence of the trade route, which is what we spoke about earlier, we can see even when they were burying their loved ones, how it influenced them as well. So essentially, we could assume that because this one, uh, which is the top of a sarcophagus, could show the influence from what part of the Mediterranean? Greek or Roman? Any guesses? Yeah. Greek. And then the more harsher features we could say was influenced by the more Roman culture. 
with these art pieces alone, we could slowly start to see the artistic influence from the trade route. Now, the big kaboom. Once the Greek and Romans, scholars like yourselves, or merchants started to come into ancient Egypt, they influenced even society. Because if they can influence art, then they can influence society. Now, whether it was unintentional or intentional, they were able to see these women that were also selling the merchants, which were male objects, and then retrieving the money themselves was a little bit confusing for them. As for them, the woman's job or duty was to stay at the house and simply be a mother. But it wasn't like that, as we know. Once they started to talk to other ancient Egyptian men and question why these women were able to indulge in so many luxuries, the men themselves started to question their equality, which is very dangerous because once a gender starts to question the authority or the privileges that another gender or species is allotted to, means that it could instill fear to the people that happen to just fear it. If control was very important in the ancient world, then having a woman who is considered equal but now is taking your power as scary, you, you would start to remove those powers, which meant as though the art is gorgeous, it brings a sad tale with it. We know as we look at these beautiful sarcophaguses, that were probably centuries away from Merneith, that the women that were also buried along with this did not have the same privileges as they did at the beginning with Merneith, which is very dangerous. Because once those privileges are removed, it trickles down to the deities and the goddesses. Which means that these little tchotchkes, which would sit on their mantles when they would pray to and they would still have, they would think of themselves to have great power, would start to lose power. Which means that they would start praying to the more male or appearing to be male gods. Which is once more starting to slowly strip away power from the women. But to bring a little kick up before we get into the real reason why we know all this, we can have a little skip into fashion. We can see in the hieroglyphs as well that the women, and some being men, were adorned head to toe with the best beads and the best jewelry. This looks like a wig if it, to some, and which it is. And over here could be parts of hair as well which meant that ancient Egyptian people and women and both men were adding accessories to themselves once more, displaying the amount of intelligence that they had at such an ancient time. They would take the hairs to make these wigs from surrounding towns or surrounding little villages who would donate their hair to the ancient Egyptian people. And with this, they were able to show nobility to the lower classes and even to the merchants themselves. We could see once more here with the art, how the art starts to slowly morph into something more Greek or Roman inspired. Specifically with this image right over here, that upon first look doesn't even look like it came from the ancient Egyptian civilization. It looked more like it would come from the Greek or Roman civilizations. Does anybody know who Herodotus is? We talked about him just on Monday. So you'll read that this. Anybody? Yes. Um, Herodotus is known as kind of like the like father's history or kind of like the first like known historian. Yes. Bingo. So Herodotus, great guy, but not really. <laughs> so he was from Greece which is now Persia, and because Greece was very male-dominated, dominated, his views when he went to ancient Egypt were very confused. So once he, once he decided to return home, he wrote many upon many books and novels on how the skeptical of equality in ancient Egypt 
basically paraded across the streets. His books, most prevalent in this specific text, shows and basically cuts down women even more in ancient Egypt, as he is insulting the men by saying that the men in these places would sit down and they would pee and the women would stand while they pee, which is basically switching the, uh, the roles of male and female. He was trying to insult them. He was trying to make a change. And unfortunately to us, he was successful in making that change because these texts were then translated for the pharaohs and the dynasties to come, which would continue to once more take the last pieces of freedom that the women were able to enjoy in ancient Egypt. This brings us closer to Cleopatra's time, which is very interesting in herself. Now, Cleopatra is a very dynamic character. Can I see a show of hands of how many people think Cleopatra is this beautiful, sexual woman? Who would agree with that statement? Think about the movies where they show Cleopatra. And they had um, Elizabeth Taylor play her in the movies. It's been showing the last couple of weeks on, um, I think it was on HBO and in some of the uh, movie channels. Cleopatra is a stunningly beautiful, highly sexual woman. Just a but in reality, she wasn't very much of a looker. This is one of the surviving coins of the ancient Egyptian times so the late dynasties, where we can see Cleopatra in all her glory. Cleopatra was known to be this very well-educated woman that swindled men into bed with her, but it wasn't her appearance that did so. She used her last bits of whatever freedom a woman could have, and she used to romanticize women with her words. Many men who came to conquer ancient Egypt would like would stay away from her and would prefer not to talk to Cleopatra as they felt that her words would bewitch them. And in one case, it did. Do we know who her lover is? Yes. Yeah, so Mark Anthony actually was taken by Cleopatra and their whirlwind love affair essentially solidified what the Greek and Romans believed, which is that women could not hold power because they were driven only by sexual temptations, which led to the slaying of Mark Antony, her lover, and slowly but surely her suicide, which is unknown whether it is snake poison or any other means, but she decided to take her life just so that nobody else could torture her and take the last pieces of freedom that a woman had in power. There was also women who ruled as kings, such as Hepzetsu, who's my other favorite queen, but she herself was stripped from her titles as well, and even from history, as we don't know about Hepzetsu only until the late 1900s when they found her in the Valley of the Kings and mistaken her to be a king with all of the hieroglyphs basically describing this noble, stoic person. And when we found out she was a woman, it was so groundbreaking that other historians decided to look more into Cleopatra and other queens at the time to show how strong they were in reality in ancient Egypt, which is quite the contrary to what we originally believed. To show another aspect of their androgyny and how power basically flowed before the freedoms were stripped away from the women of ancient times, we see this pharaoh who has the physique, or at least is portrayed with the physique, of a feminine woman, as he has larger hips and a smaller torso and smaller shoulders. This, did, this still did not remove away from his masculinity. This pharaoh in particular had only daughters, in which the history records state, but it could also be assumed that that was an insult to his physique in later history. So I leave you with Herodotus because history being derived from Herodotus's name tells a lot of different tales of equality and inequality, whether it's in ancient times or in modern times. And it's up to us as many historians to decipher those stories into truths and reality. 
Oftentimes we have to ask ourselves those hard hitting questions like, how would you like to be buried or would you marry your sibling to truly get into the head of these ancient worldly people. By doing so, we can truly see the intelligence that they were displaying and hopefully one day take that into practice in our government. As we're all in university right now, we have the ability and power to make our own paths so that one day we can make those influences for younger generations. And hopefully with that, not strip away the only freedoms and privileges certain people or genders have in today's world. We should not let men or, like, or similar to Herodotus dictate those futures because we can easily see the damages that happen when that occurs. It only takes one writing to spread itself like a seed <coughs> in the minds of people to do those damages. And yes, we learned this through ancient Egyptian history, but this can be learned through any history. All right, so thank you very much. I just wanted to add one more thing. Remember at the beginning I told you that when I began to mentor the Scapulines, I learned more from her than she learned from me. So I will tell you, 60 years before just sitting in this chair, I was sitting in a chair like you, and my professor of ancient history taught us about Herodotus, and he showed us this quote. And in the quote, it says that the Egyptian men sit down when they urinate, and the females stand when they urinate. The men stay home and read, while the ladies go out to work. And there was one more part in it. Um, the, the women carry their their burdens on their shoulders like a man would, but the, the no, I'm sorry, the women carry the burdens on their shoulders and the men carry their burdens on their heads like a woman. I said, wow. And then, you know, we got this from our teachers that the the, the, the images of the Greek, of the Egyptians with sort of eye makeup on, and of course the eye makeup was a way to protect their eyes from the sun, the way a baseball player puts the smudge under his eye to block out the glare, but it looked effeminate to us. And some of the pharaohs, like Akhenaten, their bodies looked androgynous or almost feminine. Part of that was from the inbreeding. And also, what Miss Gavilanus brought out, that the men and women wore the same type of clothing, basically like a dress, a, a, a long tunic that came over them. So the, the image we all walked away from was of the men of ancient Egypt being effeminate. Nothing could have been further. Now, when we started working together, I, I showed her this quote, and we realized the men of the rest of the Mediterranean ruled their house. A, a, a Roman father was part of familiars. He had the power to kill his wife or children if they displeased him. The women had no rights, essentially. Not that some women didn't become strong and, and some rise to some level. We concluded after this, this might have been a shot at the Egyptians because actually Egyptian women had a basic equality under the law. If an Egyptian wife could divorce her husband, and when she divorced him, she could walk away with the property. In the rest of the Mediterranean, when a woman married a man, the property was his. So Herodotus may have been taking a shot at the Egyptians not because they were effeminate or girly men or whatever you want to call that, but because simply that society, and we're, we're going back, Bernice, this almost 5,000 years ago, to where women started with a level of equality, at least under the law with the men. But by the time we get to the Roman period, following Cleopatra, Tilly, and something, sorry, Ms. Gavilanes, what happens? It, it, begins to, it begins to erode and collapse. So. Uh, we want to first of all thank you, and then we're going to go through a few and then. Any questions? Questions from the audience? Come on, there must be some, something that provokes something in this. Yes. Uh, so, is this like uh, when you describe like, the rights of the women and the rights of the men during this period? So, this is pre, is this Egypt? Is it Islamic times? Right? So, um, this is pre Islam, right? Yes. So, would you say, I don't know if you can. Really answer, but would you say the introduction, sorry, the introduction of that religion into a country was there like a 
severe change of these sort of like and it's you know like the, the woman's sort of role or you know what we can do or is it inconsistent like with religion um with the introduction of that religion more rights were taken away simply because of the beliefs in the Islamic religion. It's more conservative. They believe that the woman should be more submissive. And whether that's right or wrong is not up to myself, but it did make very, it made it very difficult for women to continue onto the path of success when there was no means to further education, which meant that whatever they learned was stunted at that specific point and further generations were also stunted in learning more. Yes. In the meantime, I'm going to pass these around so you guys can see more images. And if you've never had a chance to go to the museum, this is an example of a sarcophagus. Okay, so this uh, so I thought sarcophagus contains the coffin inside. Could you go to something? Well, the example with this. And we have some more over here as well. Just be careful with the swords, don't really remove them. But they have examples of hieroglyphs, which we can feel. We can see how they're indented or engraved into an object, opposed to just written like ink on a paper. Okay. So yes, you had a question. Yeah. Um, nice and loud, please. Okay, um, the question I had was right. Um, if the man and female were like on the same level, like equal, not slightly below and not slightly above, they were on the same level. What gave them the idea? Like, where did they get the idea that males should be, you know, superior to women? Like, did they get it from somewhere else or? Yeah, they definitely did. They got it from the influence from the Greek and Roman civilizations. So once the trade route truly started to expand and get in, inside in the core of ancient Egypt civilizations, they were able to insult the people who hadn't often heard insults towards their equality. And through that created insecurities that ended up leading to the, basically the abolishment of equality for them because they just felt so humiliated and so embarrassed that they were practicing equality that to appease the other civilizations who were visiting them, they completely stopped the equality. I think if it hadn't been for the original thoughts of the Greek and Romans, or if the trade route had been a little bit more delayed, then perhaps we can assume that there would have been a longer duration of equality where the women would have been able to enjoy that. And maybe through the delay, there would have been lasting effects of equality today in that, in that world. Could I get something to that? Remember early part, please look at me again. Remember the early part of the semester we talked about the Paleolithic period. And I told you basically the hunter-gatherers, there was essential equality between the sexes because they worked together hunting and gathering food. And probably the females contributed more calories to the diet than the men did. But if you remember, I said when the Neolithic revolution took place and people began to farm and they had surplus of food, three bad things happened. Number one, you had stratification in society where some people began to think they occupied a higher place than others. And the second thing was, most scholars think that during the Neolithic, the early farming period is when women began to become more suppressed. Because the men began to value the jobs they did more than what the females did. And the third thing that was there during the Neolithic era, era was slavery probably began at that time too. So what happens is human beings start off hunter-gatherers traveling in search of food, following the herds of grazing animals, following the, the, the seasonal rotation of the plants, and they worked together. When they began to farm and people began to have specialized jobs, and then certain people began to think they could have the goals. That the one who planned the farming activity began to think of himself as a chief. And certain people began to evaluate the jobs they did to some degree higher than the others. And then women began to lose some of the rights they had. Not some of the rights they had, we're not talking about codified rights, but the way people felt about it. The Egyptians, one of the reasons they 
the society grew up with equality for women is they were relatively at first insulated from outside influences because they had the ocean, the Mediterranean Sea to the front, to the north, the, the desert to the east and southeast, and they had the mountains further. So that culture grew up relatively in isolation. Some of those, those wonderful illustrations, you could see the influence of Crete, which we're going to talk about today when we do Greece. But that was fabulous. Any more questions? I'm sorry, I put it in there. But I wanted to pull it together with what they're doing. You know what I would love if you could? If you could grab the sign on the slide on the process of mummification and run through it quickly. This, you better pay attention because this is how you think her. And she had a perfect slide there. So if you don't mind. Yes. Pay attention and we take some notes quickly on this because some of this is, is right on your midterm. And it was like she was uh, telling the future when she brought it. There we go. This is the process. Go ahead. I will, I will talk. Um, I feel like a lot of us know a little bit of how the process of mummification goes. If they wanted to remove the brain, everybody knows they go through the nose, make the brain liquid, and then boom, no more brain. Um, they would do the same for different organs where they would basically remove it from the body or make it obsolete and then add them into these jars that we can see here. And these jars would be to keep the organs clean and organized for the pharaohs or queens in the afterlife so that they could continue living because they would not have a physical body, but they would just be a body. They'd be an abstract being, essentially. We could see how the heart would go here. Then we have the lungs, the kidney, the colon, and each deity would also represent a certain aspect of the human anatomy as well. Then the mummification process was extremely tedious and it was almost an art form in itself where you had to go to school for a couple of years actually and apprentice under another mummifier before you were able to practice on your own. What also makes this extremely interesting is that this was common practice within mostly all their dead. Have we seen burial sites for common Egyptian people? Yes or no? no? No. Do we see a lot of mummies nowadays? No. What happened to all the mummies? Well, this goes thousands of years in the future, but when the colonial and the Anglo people would start traveling down to Africa and down to the Middle East for more of the trade route purposes, they realized that there were these things called mummies, and they were pretty cool to find or pretty hard to even get to at this point, because remember, pyramids were built to avoid tomb raiders, and in this case, the Anglo people were tomb raiders. But what they would do if you had enough money back in your hometown is you would buy a mummy, they would put that mummy right onto a ship, take it to England, and then at your next dinner party, you'll have a mummy at the table to eat because they considered it the most perfectly aged meat that you could find, which answers the question, where are all the mummies today? Well, they were eaten. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. Nice and loud so we can hear both. Okay, so um, they believe that was he Hades? I don't know how to say it, but she was basically the god of life, right? She gave life. 